All right, we gotta go. John just wanted to just ask about this building right here. And I hate to even tell you, I think it's an eyesore to be honest with you, because this is what it replaced. There was a thing called the Galloway Drugstore on this corner, constructed in 1889. It was three story, downstairs was just a drugstore with a soda fountain type drugstore. Upstairs were um, inventory and meeting rooms and the top floor, actually they had some uh, local unions that had offices up there that eventually relocated over here to the Chamber of Commerce building because somebody deemed this an unsafe building. And in 19, late 1950s, City Hall condemned this building. And my friend, that, and some of y'all have seen Clay Allison's pictures, he's the one that did the colorized uh, version of the, the Santa over there. He says he recalls them having a ramp up on the second floor with a dump truck sitting up on the second floor to receive debris from the third floor. So if the place was so decrepit and about to fall down, how could it support a dump truck sitting on the floor up there? And so they tore it down and this is what took place. In the early 60s, this became a furniture store. And it, was, it went through, you name, not, uh, I think it was initially a Sturchy's brother furniture store. Then it was a Heilig Myers furniture store. Then it was a Scotch furniture store. Then it was a, some off-brand furniture store. And after all the furniture stores moved out, somebody rented it and turned it into an antique mall. And that was the best place for antiques in Sheffield. But the owners decided they didn't want all these people bringing all this old junk into their building. And so the antique mall moved down to Town Plaza at the time. And that's been about, I'm gonna say 15, 18 years ago. So we've been sitting vacant ever since. Now I hear, well, you don't have to hear, you can look. They had this paper up and you see the paper. I'm thinking it looks like it's been wet. I'm hearing the roof is about to fall in up there. And I don't don't quote me on that, BC, but that's what I've heard. So anyway, this place is just sitting vacant and has for years and years and years. And I don't know what I Y'all see the streetcar coming right up the right up Montgomery Avenue, right in front of this building here. And you'll notice the name of the building is the Blake Building named for Dr. Blake, who was one of, oh me, one, two, at least three generations of Dr. Blake in Sheffield. And Dr. Blake's office, believe it or not, was downstairs. Upstairs, this was a, a bank building. And it was a bank for quite some time, Sheffield National Bank. And I'm guessing late 50s, late 50s, early 60s, the bank moved out to right there. And that was the bank for quite a while. Because when I was working at the Chevrolet dealer, when I got my big giant paycheck of about $28 a week or something like that, I walked down here and put it in the bank so I could have money to spend like I was a big spender, you know, that was the bank. And it went through three or four different names until it went vacant. And now, you folks that know the music industry know that's the record studio today. That's the Nut House. So here's here's one one bank on one corner, and on the exact opposite end of this block on the other corner, another bank. Standing in front of where I went to the movie when I was 10 and 11 and 12 years old. This was the Cobbert Theater right where y'all are standing. <clears throat> I know this is before y'all's time, but this is the truth. If you brought on a 
special card 6RC cap from a glass bottle, that is. You could go in the movie. And then you could get a Coke for 10 cents and a candy bar for five cents. And you could sit in there from about probably this time of morning on a Saturday and you could watch Westerns or war movies all day long until it got to be feature time about six o'clock. Then they'd run all the kids out. But we just spend the day in the Cobbert Theater. And by the time I got to be a teenager, the story at the barber shop was, when you go down to Cobbert now, they'll give you two clubs, sticks. One is to hold your seat up, and the other one is to build, knock the rats off. And so it was getting kind of decrepit. And so after being built in the um, early 40s, it lasted until the, I'm going to say the mid-70s, and then it just went the way of a lot of other stuff in Sheffield, disappeared. Next to it were an appliance store and, um, and uh, uh, let me see, what else? There was a music store, three, three or four different um, storefronts right here on this vacant lot. Aviana Hospice, that's a new sign because it used to be Comfort about two months ago. Yeah. That was City Hall before City Hall, remember. The bottom part, it was built. Now, let me just stop and say parenthetically, take off all the stuff that's hanging off the sides. That's, that's new development. The guy that buying stuff up and down likes balconies and stuff, and so... Just to consider that brick building, the bottom area was where the fire wagon, fire wagon was, and then the back, very back, was four stalls for horses. <laughs> and on the lower level was the fire chief's um, office. On the upper level was, in one, one side, was a few cots where the guys slept, and across the hall was where the mayor's office was. And the mayor said after 20 some odd years, I'm tired of smelling horses. We've got to finish this building up here. And so that's what brought about the move. And, and keep in mind, that wasn't the fire hall. That's not the fire hall I was talking about when the hotel caught fire. They'd already moved out and moved up a block even closer and they still couldn't save it. But you gotta, and this is going back to the hotel, you gotta go back to construction of the hotel. What were the floors like? And what were the walls like? And all the furnishings like? It was all flammable. And after so many years, those floors and those walls just went in a rush. Don't matter about the brick on the outside. So anyway, here's what I was gonna show you. Right in here where I'm standing, where it says Sturgis, that was a furniture store right here on this storefront. And right here where this says McClellan's is this building right here. Now, you folks are the age of dollar stores. When I was a kid, down through here were dime stores. The five and, t five and dime. In fact, the sign up over the door would say, VJ Elmore's five and 10 cent store. And so these two stores side by side were, at one time when I was a kid, dime stores. But here's, here is a strange thought. This building right here, that is Sheffield Hardware today, when this building was built in 1903, it was built as a hardware store. <laughs> that was really unusual, the fact that it's gone through changes of different vendors, different businesses, and it came back. And if you know, you know that our friend Laquita Logan that bought this block right in here almost, this is one of her first renovations and restorations. She and her son restored this building 
to what they think it may have looked like right originally. So, but I will tell you this, this is the place my wife comes to buy ferns. When they put ferns out, they are huge sun ferns, which she likes, and they are not expensive. So that's just a plug for Sheffield Hardware if you're in the market for ferns. On top were, uh, depending on the owner of the building, they either used it as offices or, just like today, apartments. This was another uh, storefront that was a 10 cent store back in the day. Elmore's and, and Woolworth. But you'll notice this is the Logan room now. When Laquita Logan bought this property through here, she put in a red clay table in the Logan room. In the Logan room, for you, those of you who do not know, this is a beautiful event center rent out for different occasions. And if you've never been to the red clay table, you're missing a treat. Wonderful. Yeah. This is this building back in the day. And you say, well, wait a minute. This don't look like this building. Well, this building's been added on to because what you see is this building right here is basically right here. And where the door is, is where these windows are. This was a vacant building right beside here. See, this is vacant where this is. And so, and this was a bank. This was a bank, what does it say? Sanford Ash Realty Agency was in the bank building. Sheffield uh, Standard Bank at one time, or the People's Bank, that's it, the People's Bank. And there you got Dr. Blake's building on one end and another building on this end, and you got two major banks in one block. And the bank that came afterwards, or the business that came afterwards, added this portion of the building on and changed the doors. Now, this building is owned by Laquita Logan. And she's been in a little bit of a, how can I say this? Uh, she and City Hall are not on the same page, that's all I can tell you. Her desire for this building is a boutique hotel. But there's something about inspection, that's all I can tell you. I'm not a part of that. Don't want to be a part of it, but they need to let Laquita do what she wants to do because she has spent on this block right here multiple millions. Hello, this is Jocelyn Bowen, and I'm the director at Westville Public Library, and you're watching North Alabama Local History. I guess it helped I turn it around. This building back in the day was Walgreens. Now, way back, early 20s, research shows that this was a grocery store at one time, just a building. But, <clears throat> and it went through different, different owners for different things. But what I'm getting ready to tell you is this. When Walgreens went in, it was known as Spalding Walgreens. Now, let me just stop and say, there are Walgreens galore today. And Walgreens, as you well know, today is a franchise. It was a franchise back in the 40s when Mr. Spalding bought this property and turned it into a pharmacy. It was like a drugstore. But in addition to the drugstore, they had little booths all along this wall where you could go in and order lunch or dinner. Those little booths had, have y'all ever seen those juke box, tabletop juke box where you put the money in and push the button and the music starts playing, but you don't have the music in front of you. It was little juke box all the way down the line. And you think, how do you know that? Well, because I was in here. I just went to church right up there where that big tower is, that big, what do you call it, steeple. 
after church, we'd walk down here like most everybody else in Chapel and stand in line out here to get in because the draw to eating here wasn't the fried chicken or the chicken and dressing or the roast beef. The draw was this lady right here that was making the rolls. She made the rolls starting about daybreak every morning and she did that for years and years and years. And you'd be sitting at the table and she'd come shuffling out of the kitchen door with a beat up old pan and she'd think, good boy, that pan is ugly and dirty. Who gonna eat out of that? And everybody just be grabbing those rolls because they didn't care what the pan looked like, it was the rolls. You could come in down here if you didn't want anything in the middle of the afternoon put a quarter on the counter and say, give me two rolls and some butter, you know, and they bring out rolls and butter. The rolls were unbelievable. This was in the Times Daily, and it says, and this was dated August of 1963, 10 million rolls and still in demand. Exa Warren has baked almost 10 million rolls in her 22 years as a cook at Sheffield Spalding Walgreens, and they are still in demand. And she lived a few years longer. Mr. Spalding said if it hadn't been for her, nobody would have come to his store. And because of her, this building was too small. And so he went across the street and built that building, and that became Spalding Walgreens. And it was huge. And it had soda fountain and stuff, and it had nice tables. It didn't have the little jukebox on the table, though. And unfortunately, it didn't have her because she died right after, right before they moved across the street. And this is even worse. The day this building opened, Mr. Spaulding himself passed away. And I just hate to tell you, he messed up. He should have stayed right here and let people stand in line outside because that business never did take off. Within just a few years, it closed down. This is going to sound stupid, but if she was still living, they'd still be cooking in here. Now, uh, after Spalding went out and it stayed vacant for a few years, it became a plumbing supply, and now it's vacant again and for sale again. And right where we stand, entrance to Bill Cudson. If you travel to big cities today, even Florence had one called Belk, just Belk, standalone Belk. Belk was a well-known name, but in certain locales, Belks would partner with another person. I'm not saying it was Hudson right here, but it could have been Hudson out of Nashville, Hudson out of Memphis, Hudson out of Birmingham, I don't know. But this building right here was where all the school kids came to buy their clothes. And this was a fancy building back in the 30s and 40s and 50s and 60s. It was so fancy that if you gave them money and needed change, they'd open up this little canister and put them put a $20 bill in it and walk over to the cash register. Y'all ever seen this? And pull a flap and drop that thing in there and it'd suck it up and it'd go all the way upstairs and fall into somebody's office. And they'd put the change and drop it back down, you know. I always was amazed by that when I came to that this store. This is where you come to buy your Boy Scout uniform, you know. This was the place. I mean, it was the department store for men and women, I guess, but I wasn't a man or, men, or women. I was a kid, and this is where I came to get my, kid, my kids' clothes. And so <clears throat> for years, Bell Cutson's was um, a vital part of this downtown Sheffield. And then they closed, and then they went away. And then, and then 
it went vacant. And it stayed vacant, which is not unusual for downtown Sheffield in the 70s and 80s, 90s, 2000, still vacant. I was riding my bike down through here, and I just stopped. And um, I don't you can't see it here, I don't think, but I think they probably took it up, but it was black and white checkered tile all on the inside. And of course they brought this entrance all the way out to the to the street. But the entrance to Bell Cutsons was you'd walk off there, there it is, there it is, right there. Y'all check this out. See there's the entrance right there. I'm showing the, the department store. See this floor? That was outside when I was a kid. The entrance was back over here about where these doors are. So this was the entrance right here on the outside. But anyway, when I'm riding my bike and I rode in over there and looked through the windows, I'd look up and guess what? I'm seeing blue sky today. The roof had fallen in. The whole building was about to collapse. And I don't have a date. I guess I could look it up, John, but I'm trying to be professional today. Uh, six, seven years ago, George's 217 came in. The 217 is that, that is the address. This is 217 Montgomery Avenue. The George, if y'all know, George's Steak Pit. The Georges of Georgia State Pit bought this building and put tons of money in it. And how many of y'all been in here since it's been redone? It is beautiful. I mean, it is beautiful. This is a place where you have, I mean, they're getting ready for probably a wedding reception or something tonight. But this is an event center. No big city has something like this. I mean, it's that nice. It is really beautiful. Really beautiful. This this picture right here was made just a little bit further down behind me but this is looking back up the street and you'll notice what's not here in this in this vacant space is hotel grant this was what growing up we known as the grant hotel and there was a let me see if i can say this there was a different clientele that went to the Grant Hotel. Does that, that, that work good? There was a different clientele that went to the Grant Hotel. Uh, they claimed if you went to the Grant Hotel and you had an unusual desire, they could, they could feel your desire at this hotel. And I'll just have to tell you, God's my witness, I never did go in there. I wish I had at some point in time because the furnishings were supposed to be really nice. But that's all I could tell you. It caught fire. I don't know if that was judgment or what, but anyway, it caught fire. In fact, I saw it catch I mean, I'm not, I didn't see it catch fire. I've said that twice already. I watched it burn. I stood right over there with about half a Sheffield when word got out. Grant Hotel is on fire, and I mean, People far and wide came to watch this place burn down. And this one hadn't been that long. I mean, I'm, I'm guessing you know, 20 years ago or so. Uh, or late 90s, maybe, 30 years ago now. Let's take my word anyway. for it. This says J.B. Lagomasina. This was their point of operation. I, I started to say if I, I've asked, but I've actually begged to go in here. Y'all see the light is still on? It's been closed since the 80s. And it's not been touched. And Mr. Largo Messina died way before that. But that was his house right across the street from City Hall. He was Sheffield's first millionaire. He owned property all over town. He was on that bank board up there at the People's Bank. May have been the bank president. I mean, he was one of the founders of Sheffield. He was into all kind of business and made tons of money. The millionaire part came from selling ice, by the way, open, 
on the uh, south down on the on the river bank. When his daughters, he had how many sons? When his daughters, I'm just guessing this. When his daughters passed away, the grandchildren closed the door and walked away. Now I know one of the well, grandchildren, I know one of the great grandchildren because she was one of my students and I begged her, don't throw this away without letting somebody go through it. There is no telling what kind of historical archiving type material is in this place. And what I'll just, I'll just invite you, come look in this window. I mean, it is unbelievable. It's like they were here yesterday and got off work and went all, the, all over the yeah. So they rented building, uh, they rented property, they sold property, they sold insurance. Of course, they had the ice house until it was And it was huge. Yeah, I mean, it's like a time warp right here. Look at all these glasses piled up right here. I don't actually have this building, but I can tell you because of the proximity of the depot, which is right across the street, this is a railroad office building. And from my understanding, this cut block and behind all this siding is stonework and ironwork. And that's some of the reason that the siding won't stay on. This has been an innumerable number of businesses, furniture business, I don't know how many different things. In the last, it was a pool room, Sheffield game room or something. And the people have just walked away from this building as well. But this is a historical building. It doesn't need to be condemned to fall down. But this is the depot across the street when Sheffield was first founded, this was the first depot. It eventually went the way of a lot of other things in Sheffield and a big fancy depot was put just within sight of here, a quarter of a mile down Shop Pike, that street that runs off of Montgomery Avenue. It was built in the 50s and it was taken down probably in the 90s as well. And there is no depot. This was right on this corner right over here. And <clears throat> right behind the depot was this building, which was where trains unloaded their wares. And these bays right here back up to this first street where trucks were back in there and fill up and go deliver. So this was train operations as well. Now I will tell you, I mentioned this real early and didn't go into detail. Sheffield was founded as a steel building town. That all went away by the end of the 1920s. And Sheffield would have dried up and blown away if not for the railroad. The railroad, y'all step right here, we're getting ready to leave. 1905, looking back that way, all you would have seen is building after building after building that Southern Railway constructed fronting on what they call Shop Pike, which is another word for the street that runs by the shops. This was the place that Southern Railroad came in to build or fix train issues, work on locomotives, work on rail cars, and when they chose Sheffield as their center of operation, they brought 500 workers, which equates to probably 2,000 people to the city of Sheffield. And so we fuss and fume about having to sit and wait on the railroad, but if it hadn't been for the railroad, Sheffield wouldn't have ever made it. I'll just tell you that flat out. It would have been right gone. <clears throat> When the railroad was in place, and these buildings were railroad buildings, this, let me see if I can find that picture. This building was on that, about half of that block. These are the people who built Sheffield. This was the Sheffield 
Land, Iron, and Coal headquarters. Big building over there. Plenty of offices. Had an indoor pool for guys that were coming in to do business. Rooms to rent for guys that were coming in overnight. It was a huge building. Huge undertaking to build that building. And a lot of commerce took place in that building. By the time I came along in the 50s, that had transitioned into Plowboys. P-L-O-W-B-O-Y-S, Plowboys. Junk and treasure, more junk than treasure. But today my wife could go in there if it still was standing and spend hours. It was like an old timey antique all I recall is it was so dark in there you couldn't hardly see of course I was a kid and I could have cared less but my daddy going there looking for deals you know buying a tool or something and it went half of that block and back in the late 70s a hurricane hit the coast and it's one of those deals where the wind just stay in, stayed intact. And a huge wind hit this wall and took it down. And the building ended up having to be taken down. Because of, I mean, the, this wall that was facing First Street, part of first floor was standing. The second and third floor, the bricks were gone. And so within a few weeks, the whole building was gone. Eventually, well, Young's Welding came in in the early 80s and bought the whole block.